very excited to, to get it on with, to finally get to do what we've been trained to do for so long with airplanes that have really never been tested with American hands. and I had a little girl uh, 13 days after the war started taxiing out and uh, time to think about, you know, reflect a little bit and you know, after the first couple weeks of the war yeah, I, I thought about my little girl you know, wanted to make sure I got home to see her and uh, make sure she had a daddy to see once I got home the brief stepping out to the jets your entire focus is on uh, on getting the job done and uh, bringing everybody home safely you're so focused on uh, on doing the job and being in position and watching your radar you think you're gonna act one way and then you hope you act one way and uh, once you get up in the air you may act a little different
largest package I was ever involved on a runway was uh, 16 F-16s. So we took darn near four, well, I guess I could figure out, about 4, 5,000 feet of runway just lining the aircraft up. So it's it's really neat to sit back there, let's say, as number 10 or 12 and, and look at all these afterburners light. And it, it takes, obviously, several minutes just to get the aircraft airborne. So it's, it's really a, a neat feeling to, to see all that, that kind of air power on the runway all the time. The visibility in that aircraft is unbelievable. You're, you, you feel like you're almost outside. Uh, and all you're looking at, you can barely see uh, over the nose. The wings are well behind you, so that's not in your peripheral vision. Uh, you feel like you're on the end of a pencil, and, and the pencil is a huge jet engine. It's still quite a feeling to go ahead and uh, uh, run the motor up and light the afterburner and get cruising down the runway. five stages of afterburner lighting is always a kick in the pants and uh, it's uh, you know I, maybe uh, maybe some of us just haven't completely grown up yet but it's uh, it's always a thrill to uh, to feel the afterburner kick in and uh, accelerate you down the runway uh, accelerating to uh, uh, take off speed which is roughly 150 knots uh, just in uh, just a little over a thousand feet of runway so it uh, it goes fairly quickly gas and go. It's the uh, fastest drive through you can find. much less gas than we had programmed, and uh, we weren't able to make it home to our base, and uh, we cried to AWACS for a tanker that we needed gas. There was no tankers available, but uh, a tanker on his way home to his home base, mission complete, heard our pleas, and turned around, headed north, and uh, basically rendezvoused with us, uh, even though he was on his way home and uh, hooked up with us and gave us enough fuel to, just as the sun was rising, gave us enough fuel to bring our jet home. And that was typical of the, uh, the kind of things that the tankers did for us during the war. Are you 
Kind of Grissom Air Force Base now. Now my heart's uh, beating pretty fast, and I'm not thinking about anything but doing the job that uh, I've been trying to do right then at that moment. And, w and that is basically working my radar the best I can. I'm worried about uh, I'm worried about them having anyone airborne to shoot down or interfere with all the strikers. flying in number three position most of the time. I had it pretty good in a sense of finding targets because his lead would go down and his bombs would explode. Uh, that's when they would start shooting. Obviously the uh, downside of, uh, of being three and four is <laughs> they're the ones that get shot at a lot. The ease in which the air war was presented to the, uh, the people, you know, it, it looked like a pushover, but uh, to those that faced it in the early days, it was not a pushover. And the fact that it became very easy was, uh, was because of some hard fought battles in the early weeks. because uh, this is the real thing. Uh, and uh, especially day two when <laughs> they've shot like crazy at you and you know what to expect then and they know what to expect and, and you're hoping they don't pick up on the tactics uh, on all the airplanes that were flying. Uh, flew three sorties the very first day of the war and uh, you know you come back and, and you think, okay, well, I can do this. But as it dragged on after about 30 days of you know doing sorties every other day or every day in some respects, then you start, start to crawl out of the airplane and go, and I sure hope that's the last one. Without shutting down, just pull it right into, uh, we call it hot pit for fueling. So with the engine running, they'll just uh, taxi on up and uh, we'd uh, fill up all the tanks again. Then we'd go into the air, into our uh, into our parking spot. Uh, as soon as we shut down, immediately weapons would uh, start uh, loading up the next next uh, weapons and, uh, and any other uh, minor maintenance involved in the uh, turnaround of the aircraft. The airplane was uh, with good maintenance, and I gotta put a good plug for our maintenance guys. I, I owe them a lot of beers. They, they did a super job for us, and that's what able to keep us flying all the time. You'd come back from a mission, and they'd put you immediately onto alert, so you could get scrambled again for another one. Um, I would say normally you were probably doing something within uh, six hours from the last time you landed. The 
missions and at least the duration of the missions were uh, were fairly demanding, uh, especially initially. Uh, so uh, I guess practical things came to mind first. Uh, when we were going to get the chance for the next meal or figure out what our, uh, what our sleep cycle might be for the next day. We had much more freedom, uh, freedom of the skies over there than we would normally have at home, whereas at home you would almost always be under radar monitoring or radar control. Uh, ours was more or less radar advisories unless we were actively involved in a mission and talking to the uh, airborne, uh, airborne warning and control people. Uh, but as far as coming back to the, uh, to the local base, uh, typically we would have uh, very little need uh, to talk to them outside of 50 miles, so we would go hundreds of miles, uh, basically just talking to uh, talking to people for advisories, but not really being under any active type of uh, radar control. was the, uh, the first aircraft to go in and actually drop ordnance. Uh, we arrived in the, within seconds of the beginning of the war. Uh, Baghdad was lit up. Uh, they obviously didn't know we were coming. They weren't expecting us. And the first series of bombs that we dropped to take out their communications network were, came as almost a total surprise. From then on, uh, trips into the Baghdad area and some of the, the larger airfields were almost always met with a fairly intense uh, AAA fire. Uh, normally, the aircraft would, would get into the target unobserved, drop its bombs, and then be shot at uh, on the way out. Because we were able to get in there unobserved, uh, I think that helped us avoid a, a majority of the AAA and helped a lot for the fact that we never did get hit by, uh, by uh, so much as a bullet. The F-117 consisted of uh, roughly 3% of the total number of aircraft used within the theater of operations, and yet we were able to strike some 40 to 45% of the strategic pinpoint targets that were, uh, that were hit during the war. But even I was amazed at how well we did in combat. Uh, with almost 2,000 missions uh, against some of the, the most highly defended targets in Iraq, and the aircraft performed superbly. Not only were we able to put the ordnance directly on target where we needed it, but the aircraft came away uh, without so much as a, a scrape. Uh, the technology worked, uh, the accuracy of the systems worked, and the pilots were able to, to really knock out some tough targets with amazing accuracy. Stealth technology has proven itself to be a, a force multiplier. It allows you to get either closer to your target or to your target unobserved. And basically, in an air-to-air -air combat, or whether it's an air-to-ground, the guy who can get in closest, the guy who can get the first shot, is normally the guy who wins. Within the uh, Persian Gulf Theater, the aircraft has picked up the, uh, the nickname of Shaba, or Ghost. Uh, the pilots seem to be quite fond of that now and are considering asking the Air Force to make that the official nickname of the aircraft. air-to-ground airplane is, is not a glory airplane. It was uh, built to take a lot of hits, and it looks like it's already been taking a lot of hits uh, before it leaves the uh, production line. Basically, the A-10 can stick around and, and talk to different uh, people on the ground. It can talk to other airborne uh, assets and then figure out what the target is. So it's a, a methodical type approach to things. It's a, a VFR-type airplane, you know, visual flight rules, no clouds, uh, very good weather usually. And we, we had a lot of bad weather over there. Uh, we had guys that popped through the clouds and then found targets because they used to move stuff under it or the oil slicks and stuff. But the weather wasn't real. I'd say 50% of the days out there, you, you had to work through the holes. Air to air is, is a lot of ego. It's one, one machine against another machine versus uh, air to mud. You, you, you have all kinds of realms of things. You're going to take out a tank. You're going to take out a triple A AAA battery. You're going to take out a missile battery. Uh, you know, you're just not going to see an F-15 roll in, uh, an air to air F-15 uh, roll in on, on a SAM site or anything. That's not their job. If you talk
talk to any SF-15 guys uh, after this last war, they'll say, you know, they, they held uh, cap over us at 20 plus thousand feet while we did our work, and they were pretty impressed, too. So I think the brunt of the jokes are going to stop. Uh, it's still an ugly airplane, but it is a lot of fun to fly on. It went well, and we, we all had the feeling like, boy, we just couldn't believe we could be that overpowering, or that they were planning some kind of surprise attack, that they were going to move their forces. Obviously, the exodus of aircraft into Iran was a, was a concern. Uh, we really couldn't figure out why, if, if they were still intact, why they weren't fighting back to the degree that we were expecting, or if they were planning something else. Uh, later on, as the war went, uh, and, and, and the biggest thing, I think, for all of us is to keep the, keep the razor's edge, I guess. You know, we, we, we couldn't get lackadaisical or, or sloppy, I think. We wondered, you know, what's the big surprise? What's the mother of all battles really going to be? And when's he going to unleash this wrath on us? The apprehension slowly worked its way out uh, to the point where you really didn't think about it that much. It was, you didn't want to become complacent, but at the same time, you didn't have the lump in your throat anymore. But at the beginning, I thought, you know, we got a job to do, we're going to do it. But as, as the war continued and as the oil wells were set on fire and as the atrocities came out that were being performed against the Kuwaiti people and then to the ecology in the region, I got mad about it. I just was, I just thought, you know, whatever has to be done to end this and get this done right. standpoint on the Iraqis uh, side, they did the smart thing by keeping them on the ground. You know, we, we got a lot of them on the ground, but they would have lost a lot more if they kept them flying. What you see on the TV is the end game. Basically, once you found the target, uh, keeping the crosshairs on it is, is pretty darn easy. And, and the hard part is, uh, is getting to that point and uh, fighting your way into the target, defeating the defenses, the AAA, the missiles. And then acquiring your target, just being able to find uh, your specific building in a complex. And uh, the rules we played with there uh, were very, very strict. If you couldn't find your target, uh, you didn't drop. started heading south to uh, depart Iraq, there was always a tendency to uh, uh, a certain amount of relief, but uh, I think the, uh, the conscious thing that we, uh, that we really forced ourselves to do was uh, uh, make sure that we didn't let down. But once we had crossed the border back into Saudi airspace and we knew there was no ground threats uh, that would be active against us, uh, then there was a little more time for, uh, for reflection. You're actually getting to practice your profession. I, I always tell them peace is my profession. 